Hello, this is Matthew Morrison with Pale Horse Investigations, and I'm back again with a very interesting story for you all. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the Great Bigfoot Human War of 1855. Now, as many of you know, we have had countless wars and battles all across the United States, as well as abroad. All you have to do is look at the news or read a book, and you'll probably find all about the wars that we have had. Most of them were in history books, but there's one war that's so weird and out there that it would feel right at home in the science fiction aisle of your local bookstore. This is the Great Bigfoot Choctaw War of 1855. I also have Mike Welday here with me, and he will be helping me discuss this topic in depth with you guys, and we hope you enjoy this very interesting story. So Mike, what do we got? So according to legend of the Choctaw Indians, a long time ago, Hamas Tubey, a great Choctaw warrior and his sons encountered a group of beasts during the routine patrols through their territory. Although Choctaw Indians are already quite large, Hamas and his sons are much bigger than most of them. They stand about seven feet tall. Standing at almost seven feet tall, you can actually see that they were natural born warriors, which in fact they are. Well, Hamas and his son were what were called point riders in the Choctaw Cavalry. Ironically, they were called the Light Horsemen, which is very interesting. They were a special group of Native Americans. They were a special group of Native Americans that almost always ended up on the front lines, and they were also tasked to keep the peace within their territories. On one day, the Choctaw Cavalry were assigned to flush out a band of raiders that were victimizing some of their local farmers in the Native American culture in their local tribe. The captain of the 30 men cavalry was named Joshua Lafleur. Even though the captain was a mixed blood, half French and half Choctaw, the men of the cavalry had a large amount of respect for him. They would be more than willing to follow him to hell and back, which they actually had done several times. Although this mission will not only test Lafleur's combat abilities, it will also test all of his men. Well, the bandits had gotten quite bold. Besides taking all of their corn and vegetables and things like that, they had also resorted to kidnapping their children, their young children. Their atrocities had been taking place all over the Arkansas border and well into Choctaw territory. So the cavalry had a long ride ahead of them if they wished to flush out the bandits and rid them from their territory. The cavalry had been riding nonstop since they left the village at around 3 o'clock in the morning. Their first stop was when they came across the Clover River. About eight hours of continuous riding can take a toll on even the most seasoned riders. They had a quick break and they let the horses rest and gathered their strength for the final leg of the journey. That was about 4.30 p.m. Lafleur gave the signal to his men to get ready to embark again. Well, a couple of hours into the last leg of their journey, he began to signal the company to halt. It seemed that he had, had seen something in the distance and needed to make sure it was their target. Standing on his stirrups, which is a task for any seasoned rider, Lafleur took out his telescope so he could get a better look. He estimated that the bandits were probably about 500 yards away, and fortunately for his men and their horses, they'd gotten enough rest that day that they could mount a full armed charge at the target. With Lafleur and some of his men at the front, the captain gave the order for the rest of the men to charge into the thick forest and to smoke out the bandit groups. And everything seemed to be going as planned, or so he thought, until they reached the thickest part of the forest where the bandits were hiding. As soon as they arrived, they noticed a horrible stench of death and decay which greeted each man as he rode up. The odor was so bad that some of the horses bucked and threw their riders onto the ground. Now that might seem not so surprising, but the only horses that did not buck and throw their men off were Captain Lafleur's and Toubay's. However, much of the cavalry's surprise, something much more horrible was waiting for them inside the bandit's cap. Upon reaching the clearing that was the bandit's hideout, uh, what greeted the men was a mound of bloody bodies of dead children in varying stages of decay. Most of the bandits have already fled, but three very large ape-like creatures still remain in the camp and were feasting on the bodies of the children. Captain Lafleur, even though he didn't know what to make of the scene, still managed to draw his saber and charge the monsters. I would say, talk about having some guts. One of the huge beasts 
dispatched LaFleur's horse with just one swing of the massive arm. After he recovered from his fall, he got up with saber in one hand and pistol in the other, continuing to charge the beast. The captain ended up emptying the chamber of his Colt revolver in the chest of one of the ape-like creatures, but it still kept charging him. LaFleur hacked and stabbed at one of the beasts, and even though each hit managed to draw blood, the beast was still coming. The engagement between the captain and ape-like humans were so sudden that Tubei's men barely had time to react, and when they did, it was already too late. One of the beasts ended up sneaking behind the captain and actually tore his whole head off. Upon seeing the headless body of their captain fall to the ground, the two bays wasted no time unloading round after round of their Sharps Buffalo rifles onto the three beasts. Thanks to years of training and experience, almost all of their bullets hit the beast's head, instantly killing them, except for one. An injured ape beast tried to escape the two bays' assault, and it seemed that it would be successful in doing so, since the men had to reload their rifles. However, Robert, which was the youngest of the two Bay brothers, chased the beast and finished it off using only a hunting knife. When the rest of the cavalry caught up with him, Robert had already cut off the beast's head and let out a chilling primal yell. That, I feel, was very savage. And I really felt like he cut off his head to kind of show that it wasn't okay for the beast to rip off the captain's head. Right, I feel like it revenge. was retribution for what had happened to the captain. Which now, just shows you the level of respect they had for that man. Yes, I do agree. So, before continuing on, how large are those bullets? So, the bullets of a Sharps Buffalo rifle are, uh, I believe they're 4570, which would make them roughly the size of my pinky finger. I mean, that's a fairly good sized bullet even today, especially for the 1855. Once the cavalry regained their composure and their control over their mounts, they surveyed the land of the beast. Overall, the bandits had killed and supposedly eaten 19 human children. They buried the poor children in 19 separate graves, and they buried their beloved captain and honored him with a 21-gun salute. As for the bandits, the cavalry threw the bodies of the beasts into a large bonfire and lit it ablaze. The cavalry journeyed back to Tuscahoma, and even though they were somewhat successful with their mission, the cavalry had to contend with all the horrors they had seen. It's also doubtful if they would ever be able to get back to the way they were before the incident. Now, there is very few actual articles from the time mentioning any of this, possibly because it was mainly Native American, and so a lot of it didn't go on record. Now, you did find that there was, however, a document for LaFleur talking about his death from the time. Yes, so that's one thing that is agreed upon when, whenever you read any of these stories. Captain LaFleur actually existed. He was the captain of the Choctaw Cavalry. You know, his heritage of half French, half Choctaw was documented. And even the day he died in the woods of decapitation was also was also documented. It just, there's no mention of the hairy beasts in any like proper documentation. The tale does indeed incorporate various historical facts as Lafleur seems to have indeed been a real person who did die in 1855 and the Dubais are apparently real as well. But this means little in the large picture as any historical figure can be inserted into any wild story you like. Sort of like fan fiction. Not helping the matters either though, is while the story has made the rounds on the internet, the best source I can find linking it back is the title of a book called True Bigfoot Horror, The Apex Predator, Monster in the Woods, Cryptozoology, Terrifying, Violent, and True Encounters of Sasquatch, Hunting People, Cryptozoology, Sasquatch, Paranormal, Volume 1, by Jeremy Kelly, which seems to be just a collection of unconfirmed Bigfoot anecdotes, and as we can apparently see, some reviews that were not so kind on the book. This is not to say that it was all debunked, but it does make you wonder. The best source of information detailing the Choctaw's history of Bigfoot comes from a half-page article published in the July 9th, 1978 edition of the McCurtain Sunday Gazette. Under the headline, McCurtain County Has a Man Beast. Reporter Len Green knew many of his Choctaw neighbors whose families were relocated to the area during the early 1800s. Old-timers who had lived there their entire lives recalled decades of Bigfoot encounters. 
One man claimed that the origin of the man-beast was a tale told in his family for generations. It began during the early 1830s when a great witch, or Hatakchaya, moved into the area. He brought with him one of these huge hairy monsters from the great Mississippi swamps and used his powers to enslave it. The Choctaw name for the man-beast is Hatak Lusa Chita, which translates to mean big black man. The witch man could not order the creature to kill, but could dispatch him to harass people he didn't like. The beast would lurk around homes, causing mayhem and terrifying the inhabitants with his hideous howl. However, when the creature sensed fear in others, he became fearful himself and fled in terror. The witch's reign of terror lasted for 30 years until a family who had been the focus of his anger decided to take action. One moonless night, the man and his sons crept into the witch's home, tied him to his bed, and then burned his house to the ground. The demise of his master freed the creature to run wild. According to Choctaw legend, if you're fortunate enough to encounter the band beast and show no fear, you will be his new master. The first reported sightings of such a creature by a white settler in this remote region was recorded in a diary entry dated May 14th, 1849. Another word for Bigfoot that they had, they called him the Shampy. Now, according to this legend, the Shampy still lives in the deepest parts of the woods so far in the forest that no Choctaw has ever been able to find the location of his dark and ravenous cave. The Shampy cannot stand the brightness or the sun or even open air because of how much it lived down in its cave. The smell of blood will attract him and he will follow the person who has been hunting and carrying around his game. Shampies do not have very good vision due to the long exposure in the cave to total darkness but they do have a keen sense of smell and they can track any person or animal for miles. It is said that the Shampi makes a whistling noise as he stalks through the forest. His scent is so terrible that many people have died just from smelling it. The Choctaw says he smells similar to a skunk, but much, much worse. According to the Choctaw, some are very hairy, but others are close to hairless. The Choctaws won't live in the area where the Shampi will live or have even been spotted. The Choctaws will often be caught or chased by a shampy. If someone were to drop a small game such as a rabbit or squirrel, the shampy will stop, eat it, and may be drawn off their trail by the blood of the small animal. To this day, the Choctaw will still not live in areas where the shampy have been spotted. <laughs>